uh, the recent election, we had uh, mostly not close races, but there were a couple where you looked at the numbers and you went, hmm, that was kind of close. One of those was the Bill Ridenauer Maria Russo race. That was the 100th, in which you had uh, Ridenauer at 53%, Maria Russo at 47 Another one that was relatively close was the 97th, Chris Anders. And this is the John Hardy seat, the one with 54.5% of the vote, Lucia Valentine. The Democrat had 45.5% of the vote. Chris joins us via telephone as we speak. Chris, good morning to you, sir. Congratulations once again on your win. Okay, well, good morning. Thank you so much. Yes, it was a uh, very long night waiting for Berkeley County to post the results. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, that that that, that was uh, a very long night. Yeah, because Berkeley County couldn't get their vote totals uploaded until a little after 10 o'clock. And up until that point, it was only the Jefferson numbers. And I think Lucia Valentine had, uh, uh, what was the edge, about 200 votes there, Chris, between you and Lucia while she had the Jefferson County vote totals in? Well, I might know the number exactly. It's 257. <laughs> Maybe I was watching it very closely. <laughs> yeah, Ber uh, Berkeley County went uh, in your direction and tipped the scales in, in a big way. Uh, what do you suppose was the difference between Berkeley and Jefferson County and the way those votes broke? Was it simply registration numbers? Well, it's, it's registration numbers per party and also the, uh, the districts uh, that I had in uh, Jefferson County are some of the most uh, liberal uh, uh, Democrat-leaning districts, with the exception, of course, of uh, downtown Shepherdstown. Uh, I felt pretty good that we only lost uh, Jefferson County by 257 votes, and then Berkeley was able to put us way over the top. So uh, I think it has to do with, you know, uh, I love Shepherdstown. I go there a lot to eat. But you can also tell that Shepherdstown is radically different uh, than, you know, four miles outside of it no doubt. Uh, as far as the uh, political climate. So I, I know this is your first time holding office, but you've certainly mm -hmm. been involved in politics uh, for a long time. Do you govern any differently as a member of the House of Delegates with a 54-46 win than you would if it was like the Berkeley County races where it was 70, 72, 77 percent of, of the vote? No, you do not, because in the end, um, the voters have spoken. Uh, they did their first job. Uh, they they, they uh, cast their votes uh, to uh, uh, to elect uh, who they wanted to represent them, and it wasn't like they, uh, in any way, shape, or form, did not understand what they were voting for. Because I knocked on over six thousand uh, doors and talked to thousands of voters. They know exactly who I was, and that person is no different today. But keep in mind, you know, we, we that's just their first job, and it's time for us, to, you know, now that we're elected to do ours. But their second job is voters think they can vote every two years and kind of go away, but it's their duty to hold us accountable for the campaign promises we made. What does this state need to have fixed first, Chris, and your attitude in <laughs> regards to going in as a delegate, one of 100? Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. One one-hundredth of one-third of the government, yes. Yes, that's good <laughs> math. <laughs> you know, going in, and I will say as a side note with that, I've probably been involved in 200 to 300 legislative fights at a minimum now in almost two decades of political activity. So I understand politics, I understand how it works, and I understand how we got really hard bills across the finish line in dozens of states. So it's it's not like I'm a typical freshman going in, but looking at what West Virginia needs, you see, you know, I, I'm always a supporter of liberty. You're looking at economic liberty and you're also looking at personal liberty. One of the first things we need to do is follow Texas's lead at the state level, criminalize illegal immigrants. Then we need to move our, our educational system as a train wreck. We keep throwing money at it, and we've been at you know either the bottom or within one or two of the bottom for as long as I can remember. Uh, so full and complete school choice. We need medical freedom. Uh, we need to eliminate the rain tax and prohibit any cities, municipalities, and towns from taxing people for the rain that falls on their property. Uh, speed up the income tax elimination because, let's be frank, uh, this is a very, very tough economy everybody's existing in. Most voters I talked to could not afford to uh, pay their either their rent or their mortgage and their medications, put food on their table, and provide for themselves. So we need to get the money back to the people. You know, there's other things I'm looking at as far as, like, you know, ending civil asset forfeiture and restoring people's due process of law, um, you know, Eliminate the business income tax, which we tried that previously, but we need to make another go at it. 
um, you know, there, there's a whole whole list, uh, you know, of, of things that I'm working on. In fact, I'm typing away right now. I, I'm lucky because I have a really good team. I've assembled a team now of people I've worked with in politics for over a decade plus, from legislative analysis to bill writers uh, to people to help me make sure – you know, what we're submitting is what we really want, and also to help me analyze every bill that I vote on every day down at the Capitol, because too often they rush these bills through. And I've ran programs where we had bill analysts for our bill champions in different states, so every day early in the morning they had a complete rundown of the bill. And I've luckily I have a wonderful young lady who's going to be helping me with that and analyze every single bill I have to touch while I'm down there. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, good morning, Chris, and, and congratulations. Uh, you good mentioned morning. You mentioned personal liberties, and that goes back to Amendment 1, uh, which uh, physician-assisted suicide, and I've made a point two or three times, it's chipping away at our, public, uh, our personal liberties. What's your position on Amendment 1? I supported Amendment 1 because, you, you, you know, you, how can I say this? Um, uh, God puts us on this planet, and it's not our decision to take ourselves off this planet. And, you know, uh, there's been a lot of manipulation uh, by uh, the medical uh, field, whether it be in Canada talking 22-year-old girls and they're killing themselves because they're depressed over a relationship. Uh, we don't want to have that manipulation here. We don't want, uh, you know, doctors being paid to tell uh, our older residents that, well, you don't want to be a burden on your family, so why don't you go ahead and take yourself out? Um, that that's that's just absolutely wrong. Well, we can argue whether that's actually existing or that's just political rhetoric, but it does infringe upon one's personal liberty. So, how do you can reconcile the two? Reconcile the two between Amendment One and and personal that's, liberty. That's right. Yes. Um, uh huh. Well, isn't isn't suicide considered uh, in most states uh, in these United States to be uh, at least somewhat of a, of a criminal offense? I don't think so. Uh, in many states, it is. Uh, in many states, it currently is. And, uh, and who unfortunately, do you, who's uh, hard to prosecute. Yeah, how do you prosecute somebody that commits <laughs> yeah, you suicide? Don't prosecute, but it, but it goes in hand with. Let's say um, suddenly I'm upset because I didn't, you know, uh, get my targeted buck for the year in bow season, and <laughs> I want, you know, I give up and I commit suicide. My wife is certainly not going to get uh, any type of. Uh, isn't uh, isn't that criminalizing suicide? Isn't that criminalizing no, suicide? I'm just using that as, as, a, as, as, a, as a joke, right? And, yes, suicide is a horrible thing, that people that get to the point that they don't see any way out. They have no hope, and they can't see forward, and a lot of that has to do with the society that we have created. We've created a society uh, that is, you know, every day – People are slowly getting poor because of our monetary system. Every day, government encroachment in their life increases with the federal uh, alphabet agencies. We've created a system. America used to be where you could go, and based upon your dedication and your abilities, you could do anything you wish to. Now there is a slew of uh, federal agencies and taxes that prevent people from rising like they used to be able to. I can understand that people have less hope uh, for for advancement, and sometimes they feel trapped. Uh, but you know, it, it is really sad, and um, you know, you hate to see anybody in that type of situation. Um, I personally have lost uh, a good friend of mine uh, who did commit suicide. He's one of the military members uh, who, when he came back uh, from Iraq, um, just couldn't adjust to life. And uh, there needs to be, you know, we need to do more with the mental health aspect of that. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's a very sad thing. But it's something that should not, you know, the state should not permit is, you know, uh, assisted suicide. Because if it, that's kind of, you know, I, I, you know as, uh, you're assisting in the, in, in the murder of, some, of an individual. So, um you know, and, and being paid to do so in many cases. So that is uh, morally wrong. And I want to just addressing whether or not suicide is legal or illegal under modern U.S. law. This is to, this is from the law.stackexchange.com website. Under modern U.S. law, suicide is no longer a crime. Some states, however, classify attempted suicide as a criminal act, but prosecutions are rare, especially when the offender is terminally ill. Assisting a suicide is a crime in all but two U.S. states, Colorado and uh, Oregon, um, I think is the one that says here. There's something in the way of me being able to read it. But 
that's the best I can give you on a description as to the legality of suicide. Now, my producer, Dylan, gives us a thumbs up on that one. And <laughs> it, it does go on to state that uh, obviously prosecuting a successful suicide is <laughs> impossible. Right. So impossible. Right. Uh, there you go. And then Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> Good morning. Congratulations. I, Good morning, Bill. I, I've, I've always thought that I've always projected out that election night <clears throat> must be a, a bunch of high fives followed by a, oh, crap, you know, what what have I done? <laughs> and so I'm curious, what is the next step and what are the logistics? Like, it, it's like first day of school where you go to the to to the the, the school supply store and you, and you, and you get your tablets and pencils and stuff. What is, what is the next step? I mean, how do you know where your office is and, and all of that? What is actually the next step as a freshman delegate and committees? Yeah. And, you know, as far as logistics, um, I'm waiting on, I talked to the speaker last week. He was sending me a package with all the different logistics and I'll work through that. Uh, that, that's, that's not a big deal as far as where you stay or anything else. Um, considering we drive from the Panhandle, which is four and a half to five hours, depending on, upon traffic down to Charleston. But, um, you know, that's the logistics side of things. Then there is the, <clears throat> the understanding that, okay, we have to transition from a, a campaign team now over to a, a serving team that we're serving the people and we're serving the constitution. And, and that is a bit of a change. And that change is, like I said, I've already begun to work on that one. Um, because too often, you know, when they're down at the Capitol, uh, people are voting on bills they don't read. I mean, it not only happens in the U.S. Congress, and due to no fault on their own, stuff just ram through. Uh, so understanding and preparing uh, for that type of uh, environment and putting the uh, necessary pieces in play so that one does not get caught uh, voting wrong on a bill is, uh, is, is vitally important. But there, there's a lot. Uh, you're looking at your life, going, okay, this is not going to change. I'm going to be in, you know, in Charleston for you know three plus months, and then a couple, uh, you know, a couple days here and there, um, which would be radically different. Uh, but for me, I've worked, like I said, I've worked in politics, you know, part time, you know, for almost, you know, two decades, and full time for about six or seven years now. Uh, so I'm used to the political grind. I'm used to the insanity that January through April uh, generates and uh, getting used to the lack of sleep on that time period. So it, there, there will be a mental adjustment, I'm sure. Uh, but like I said, I, I, you know, uh, this time of year is always the slow time of year um, in politics and, and often during the summer unless you're working federal politics. But things are going to get really crazy, and you just know that going in. What's your question real quick here? Uh, you mentioned the speaker spoke with you last week. And we're talking with uh, Chris Anders, who was victorious in the 97th general election after winning the primary over Pam Brush. The speaker, if I remember during the primary, did an ad for Pam Brush in, mm -hmm. in your district. D mm -hmm. Does that affect your relationship with the speaker now that you've been elected? Chris. No, not really. I mean, in the end, it's it's policy that matters. It, it isn't personal; it's policy. Uh, um, and with West Virginia having, I think, at this point, the largest supermajority of uh, Republicans, we should be the freest and most constitutional and profitable state in the union. And uh, uh, we hope we all work together to get there. Do you anticipate voting for Roger Hanshaw as speaker? I haven't heard, um, you know, any details. If there's anybody else running for, uh, for speaker of the house, I have no idea um, what the lay of the land is. From my understanding, is that Roger would be the only uh, the only person uh, that will be put up uh, for speaker. Now that could change in the next two seconds, two weeks, who knows? Um, but all that's just conjecture. What 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 can happen moving forward? What committees would you like to serve on, Chris? You know, honestly, uh, everybody wants judiciary because the judiciary is necessarily the, the most powerful. But I'm looking at things like uh, banking and finance, uh, health, um, you know, education, a uh, big portion uh, of, of my platform, um, you know, and natural resources. Naturally, being a hunter, I, I'd like to be the part in uh, natural resources. I mentioned finance, but yet uh, as you were going through your litany of things you'd like to do earlier, you mentioned revoking or eliminating certain taxes. Uh, mm -hmm. If we eliminate those taxes, government still has to function. Uh, how would right. you compensate for the loss of revenue? Uh, well, you, you know, that's, that's always a false choice. 
um, you eliminate the size and scope of government. It, it's just really that simple. Um, you know, our founding fathers envisioned a government that was so small you could barely see it. Now we have a government that interferes in virtually every aspect of our lives. Anything you want to do, and you don't think, well, is this right? Should I be doing it? And most people just spend their time going, is it legal? Uh, I think in one of the debates I had alluded that I uh, you know, was vice president in charge of North American operations uh, for an international company for many, many years. And during that time period, most of my time was spent, spent uh, dealing with government regulations, you know, keeping us out of hot water, making sure we're crossing all our I's and dotting our T's and so on and so forth. Uh, when really that's not the job of being in business. You're in business to make money uh, and to expand your business, hire workers, and so on and so forth. So it's a matter of uh, just reducing government and getting it down to the point that our founding fathers saw it to function. Because the, the, I've said this a million times, the only rights government has to do anything is, is protection of individual life, protection of individual liberty, and protecting your private property rights, which includes the money you earn through uh, the sweat of your brow. So uh, anything outside of that realm uh, is, is government interfering uh, in individual life, liberty, or property. A lot of times they create programs, uh, supposedly, well, I don't care whether it's uh, building parks or you know, who knows what, what they're involved in, um, you know, Little Lake Field, you name it. Uh, but that actually violates your private property rights because they take more and more of your money away to fund it. So we want to get the money back to the people. The people cannot afford the government we have right now. When we rebelled over a 2% tax on tea, but now the average West Virginian spends more on government than they do on their clothing, housing, and food combined in a year, we have a major problem, and our founding fathers would be ashamed of us. God bless you, Mr. Gastro. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> By the way. And, and, I wasn't and sure Chris, that was a sneeze or what that was. <laughs> that was a sneeze. I apologize. <laughs> and, and Chris, I can only hold him for so long, you know? <laughs> in, in regards to that funding, I would say that I think many people would hear that and go, yeah, I'm all for government spending less money, except when you think about all the things government is obligated to spend money on, and that includes education and mm -hmm. highways and roads. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we've got this whole social problem of children in this state whose parents have been affected by the opioid crisis. Maybe they no longer are in the house or even alive. And the state has to take mm -hmm. care of these kids in some form or fashion. And all this requires money. Yes, all of it requires money, but isn't necessarily does all of it have to be government money. In other words, just because you object to government spending money on something, people think you object to it in general. For a very long time in our history, up until 1913, there was no individual taxation. In fact, individual taxation was banned by the United States Constitution. They rammed through individual taxation at the same time they rammed through the Federal Reserve Act, which created fractional fiat currency, which has created the inflation. Um, but prior to that, um, we still had roads, we still had hospitals, we had uh, fought and won uh, seven or eight wars at that point. Uh, people weren't dying in the street of starvation uh, because, you know, again, uh, it's just like my wife and I. We, we support many children overseas. We, we uh, donate to charities who take care of, uh, you know, children in need. Uh, if people had their money back instead of government, because government is always the least effective way to do anything, if people had their money back, then they could donate uh, to charities to do a lot of the same work. Now, I'm not saying that we don't do some of those functions, but if you take a look at the state budget, which I will be, and I have pledged never to vote for a state budget that does not reduce the size, scope, and spending of, of government, uh, I'm sure you know one could easily go in there and find pointies of 30 percent uh, to eliminate. It's it's you know everybody packs, and that's another thing they they, they claim is a balanced budget is not really. Then what they do is they pack on the back end all the ports. So when they quote unquote have surpluses, instead of the money going back to the taxpayers, they go to all these uh, all these port projects. And uh, that needs to stop as well. I mean, we've been watching, especially during campaign season, politicians running around with checks from the state, giving it to everybody and anybody, uh, basically using taxpayer money to buy votes. Uh, that needs to stop as well. Well, I'm, I'm going to go back to 1903 or 1918 or 1913, actually, when they no, I got my years all messed up there. The automobile, yeah, the only, automobile has only been around for about eight 
nine years, if, and mm -hmm. there weren't the roads that we had were mostly for a horse and buggy. So there, there weren't a whole lot of roads that we had to maintain in 1913, but there sure are now. That's a pretty well, extensive system with 350 million people, and in this state alone, the roads are in terrible condition. Well, yes, they are in terrible yeah. condition. I think that because a lot of that centralized down in Charleston instead of having uh, local counties responsible who have boots on the ground to see what's they, actually They don't want there. it. Chris, they don't, the local counties don't want responsibility for fixing the roads. Of course they don't want the responsibility. That doesn't mean that's not a duty. So uh, when, it, when it comes back to when you're saying we didn't have that many roads, I'm sorry. From the time of the American Civil War, there was something called Macadam Roads, which were essentially um, you know, tar and chip roads, and we had quite a few of those. We also had an enormous uh, railroad system. Uh, at that point, so uh, and we're talking about 1860, not 1913. Hey, we're um, Chris. We're just about out of time here. We ran out of our conversation time based on, <laughs> on we can continue with roads on another day here. Thanks for your time this morning. Sorry to cut you off, buddy. Oh, that's right. You guys have a great day. Thank you.